Hello and welcome to Nigeria Votes today. My name is Vivian Oguche. Please forgive us for coming on board late today. We apologize. It was just due to technicalities. And now, in the First Republic, Nigeria uh, has had five successive elections, general elections, 1999, 2003, 2007, 2011, and 2015, with each of them recording high electoral violence. Over 800 lives were reportedly lost to pre- and post-election violence in 2011, particularly in about 12 northern Nigerian states. Ten youth corps members serving in Bochi state were among the casualties, an occurrence that plunged the nation into mourning. We don't want a replay of that kind of tragedy, and so today we take a holistic look at the electoral violence in Nigeria and how it can be curbed. So allow me to begin the show uh, with the latest on the forthcoming election. Uh, so the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, uh, in Ogun State, uh, says that um, everything will be done accordingly to the timetable. It says with such education, it will be difficult for any gladiator or electorate to compromise electoral processes before, during, and after the polls. The commission held a market outreach at La Fenwa on the consequences of vote buying and other electoral malpractices. Our vote is the power to select uh, those that will govern us. Our vote is important, especially in this 2019 general elections, to choose our leaders. We've been saying it. We shall say no to vote buying, vote selling. We shall say no to violence. We shall say no to thuggery, ballot snatching. We, we are saying that at this time, especially to our mothers, that we should tell our young ones, our youth, our children, that they should stay away from thuggery. They shouldn't allow the politicians to use them to foment trouble, to create chaos, to disrupt the peaceful elections that we are and now 37 out of the 45 governorship candidates in Aquaibom State have signed a peace accord to ensure a credible and violence-free poll. The candidates signed the pact on Wednesday under the watchful eyes of the State Commissioner of Police and INEC resident electoral commissioner in the presence of major political stakeholders in the state. Addressing candidates and stakeholders, the state INEC rec Mike Igini, who debunked media reports of his transfer out of Aquaibom assured that the commission under his watch will ensure the conduct of credible polls. We want to enjoin you that peace is a precondition for the kind of exercise we are going into. As umpire, the duty of the umpire is to ensure integrity driven electoral process where the vote of the people will not only count, but be taken into account in determining who becomes one. You are present here alone to sign the peace accord has given us great joy. It's the beginning of success for the elections to come in a few days' time. We are ready to go, we have prepared ourselves, we have trained and we are training our personnel to give confidence to all of us, not just in Aquaibo. The elections in Aquaibo and in the as a whole have become a world of prayer. You see, uh, election is a part of democratic process. We should allow it to be free, peaceful and credible. And I think in this case, security agencies have a whole lot of role to play because uh, the blame is so much on politicians. But politicians won't do anything if they don't have the support of the security agencies. So I want to believe if all hands are on deck and all stakeholders, we talk to ourselves, that we want a very free, credible and peaceful election, we'll achieve it as a country. Right, that's about it on the latest uh, uh, report we have for you ahead of the forthcoming elections. Now to discussions proper. 
Four months ago, stakeholders at a workshop organized by the International Republican Institute, IRI, uh, identified the ineffectiveness of rule of law and weak institutions involved in electoral processes as some of the factors instigating violence during an election in the country. Now, for more perspective on this, I'm being joined by a public affairs analyst. His name is Femi Lawson. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure being here. For joining us today, yes. <coughs> so, um, there's this issue of electoral violence recurring over and over. Why is it so? Why do you, th why do you think electoral violence has become a recurring decimal in Nigeria? It has become a recurring decimal because if you recall, you know, even during the IRI, you know, conference, you realize that the question of the rule of law was very central at that conference. And how do we call, really call electoral violence when we don't have, even when we have laws in place to tackle the menace of electoral violence, but there's no political will, there's no readiness on the part of the authorities to punish perpetrators and rather than having a reduction in cases of electoral violence we're having an increase and is it the dangerous dimension that this has taken yeah. unlike the past in the old republic or what we witnessed in 2003 2011 which was one of the most terrible periods mm -hmm. you know and the skirmishes in 2015 before one of the major cases of violence too that we had during the governorship election in Barrison State. Mm -hmm. One thing that has become a recurring decima now is the fact that violence is not even only perpetrated by the urchins, the mm -hmm. ordinary political talks any longer. Mm -hmm. Today you find people who are occupying positions, you find politicians, mm -hmm. you find people who are known within the society mm -hmm. leading these act you know, actions of violence. Only yesterday mm -hmm. or thereabout, a sitting governor in this country threatened violence mm. on observers. So these are the things. Are you the referring to the governor, the governor, state governor Malam Nasri He denied. You know, when he, of course, it's a public knowledge, he was not quoted out of contest. He may deny it for whatsoever reason. But how many ordinary citizens, how many uninformed citizens who listened to a governor threatening to return, you know, foreign observers to their countries in body bag? How many of them have listened to the rebuter? Mm -hmm. How many of them have re listened now to the denier? Do you, do you know how far we can really go in instigating the ordinary folks on the street if an executive governor can threaten that level of violence? Now come to other category of politicians. We've had ministers, we've had senators who have been indicted, mm -hmm. you know, to have been involved in perpetrating violence during elections. But what is the problem? They, are, they perpetrate violence in the election. Sometimes they are even arrested by the police or other security agencies. Sometimes they are even, you know, you know, made to face, you know, the media, you know, paraded, right? But what do we find after that? They mm -hmm. come back to the street. Not only do they come back to the street, some of them find their way back into government. Mm -hmm. And that is the most unfortunate situation. And that is why, till date, we have not been able to deal with this very ugly you know, incidents of electoral violence, which is not just an act of human rights violation on the electorate or other victims. Mm. It is not just a crime, as you know, violence may be categorized, mm. but it's also a major threat to our democratic advancement as a country. Which brings me to my next question. You, you referred to what the governor of uh, Kaduna said, Nasir El Rufai, what he said yesterday, and of course it's rebuttal. Uh, you see that as ele electoral violence. You cl do you classify that as electoral violence? It's a, it's a prelude. It's a prelude. Yeah. Oh, so I was going to say, right, uh, the electoral law, how it defines electoral violence, is it adequate? No, of course, the, the electoral law as presently, you know, constituted mm. as you know made taking enough steps and it is not only until machete, machete machets and guns you know are used on election dates or during the electoral period that's not just that, when it's you know, classified some of this conduct as inciting statements you know statements that can be made to incite violence mm. this are, and it is like, like i said it's not until someone brings out 
the gun on my chest mm. to inflict injuries or kill. They are, for every act of violence, especially during election, mm. if you go back to history, they are usually products you know, or results mm. of one utterance or the other from somebody or the other. It's, you, you rarely find a situation where people just wake up on the election day or during the electionary period, waking up just burning houses or mm. waking up just holding matches and guns. No. Someone somewhere, especially people who are privileged mm. in this society, have always been responsible you know, by their utterances, mm. by the kind of speeches they make. Go and look at it. This has always been responsible you know, for the cases of electoral violence that we have witnessed in this country. So we have dealt with the root cause as well as the nature of electoral violence. Let's talk about law enforcement. We've had so many cases of electoral violence, but have you had cases of, I mean, those culpable being prosecuted? Have you had? I mean, do you think a law enforcement agencies are doing enough to curb electoral violence? Nothing, not even enough. Nothing fundamental is being done on the part of our law enforcement unions. I want to say with all sense of responsibility that our law enforcement, enforcement agencies have failed in, you know, in prosecuting electoral violence you know, offenders. What am I saying? In this country, like I said, we've had instances where people were elected, were, were arrested you know, during elections, mm. people were caught you know, perpetrating violence. You know, let me cite an instance. Mm. We were in Bayesa in December 2015. And at a point, the election got to a period where, as observers, we were held hostage in some part of the state that we could not even return back to the state capital. Mm. Members of the press were held hostage. Cameras were seized, journalists were beaten, mm. and people were arrested. Not only were people not only were people arrested, in actual fact, some of these beatings, some of the hostages, some of the violence were supervised by known politicians. And after this, in actual fact, police moved in, arrested some corporates, you know, arrested some of these thugs, seized a lot of guns, the military was brought in. After that, we started making a lot of noise. After the election, we went back in January for a rerun. Mm. There was still a repeat. Of the same thing. Of the same thing. And why was there a repeat? For everybody that were fingered to have perpetrated violence in December, nobody was taken to court. In January, they came back again. Yeah. After that, the civil society organizations did an assessment of the situation. We came out with findings. Not only that, even the government of Bayelsa State mm. came out you know, set up a judicial commission of inquiry, constituted it, you know, seven men, men of integrity in their society. They came up with a recommendation. To date, to date, no single person has been prosecuted. We submitted our report to the various security agencies. We submitted our report to the National Marriage Commission. We submitted our report to the Amnesty in Nigeria. Even the government of Bayelsa State promised while receiving the report of its own panel of inquiry to prosecute perpetrators. But they are, in fact, in actual fact, one of the main persons fingered is a, is a serving minister in this country today. One of them is also contesting an election in the forthcoming election. A lot of them are also vying for positions. And how do we now say that in the coming election there will not be a repeat? Because we have failed as a society to deal with perpetrators, we have continued to instead celebrate them. These are people who enjoy the privileges of being members of the ruling political party and they think they could do it. And until we begin to take people to court, just like we take people who steal money, just like we take the ordinary people who fight on the street of Oshodi, you know, and Ikeja to court, just like we begin to parade them, the same way we parade suspects who are involved in robbery, kidnapping. If we don't start parading perpetrators of electoral violence, these people will continue to perpetrate violence and they will begin to continue to endanger our democracy. Mm. There's something you said during your commentary that just stuck. You said, we keep celebrating some of these people who are culpable. So it swings both ways, both the follower and the leaders, right? As a follower, you know this person is culpable. Why do you still vote for this kind of person? Well, they may not necessarily be, be voted for. Okay. The truth is that, you know, the system, especially the government, creates an opportunity for them to get away with most of this crime and they are imposed back on the society as leaders. 
Take for instance, if somebody you know, was caught on camera, mm. leading thugs all over the polling unit, disrupting elections, the same person was indicted even by Judicial Commission of Inquiry, mm. and this person is now appointed a minister of the Federal Republic. The system has automatically imposed him on the society. Then the people are compulsively made to become subjects mm. of such persons who ordinarily, by moral standard, is not qualified to occupy such positions. So you think it's an institutional problem? Yes. Okay, you, let me ask you this question. I, I have two very important questions that I have to ask before we wrap up, right? Let's talk about the spillover effect of electoral violence. Would you say one of them is voter apathy? V very clearly. After the incidences that we had in 2011 and 2007, we find situations where people in some of those places were reluctant to vote in our own assessment, not only that, you even find people who ordinarily were always zealous to volunteer to work for the Electoral Commission, mm. you know, withdrawing. In actual fact, it takes a lot of confidence building that we have now, maybe in the current leadership of INEC, for most of our youth core members to accept working as ad hoc staff. Mm. In as we speak today, a lot of them are not going to work. Mm. As, uh, yes. Fear, right? The, the fear of electoral violence. And what ordinarily should, you know, be the joy of a young Nigerian serving the fatherland more than participating in such a patriotic, you know, national assignment. It is the aspiration then of mm. the, in fact, the average youth come member was looking up forward to the election then. But today people are afraid. Today you find what happens during, you know, camp political, not even inter-party, inter mm. within the same political parties. An internal one, this is what you're So you can imagine that. what the ordinary persons you expect. If on, within your own political party, mm. you're organizing a campaign and you are killing people. So how do you expect the electorate that you are invited to vote for you mm. on election day to feel secure? So it's creating a lot of apathy mm. and it's creating a lot of fear in the mind of our people. And that's why I keep saying that it's a major danger and a major threat to the growth of our democracy because you cannot have a democracy when you don't have the participation of the people. Democracy is about the people mm. and the, it's, the participation of the people must increase, not decreasing out of fear, you know, of electoral violence and you know, con conduct that may likely endanger their lives. What do you think is the solution? The, the solution, solution is that as a country, we must criminalize electoral violence. People must be dealt with. People must see electro electoral violence as crime, not just as mere political you know, shenanigan. It must be seen as a serious crime. Perpetrators must be fa made to face the law squarely, and nobody should be made to be above the law when you are involved in electoral violence. Because if you believe in democracy, if you are participating in democratic processes, then you must know that any conduct that will endanger such democracy is illegal, and you must not engage in it. So we must begin to prosecute people People must be sent to jail. People must be taken you know, pre to prison in this country mm. before we begin to deter even the younger ones from getting it. A lot of people are willing to be involved today because they think one godfather is there, one man in position is there, mm. and they could easily walk out of the, the, the net mm. if they are caught. You know, you've shared, it, finally, on the, just a few seconds, you've shared with me some of your experiences. So you know, you know the signs, you know, when some of these things are about to happen, you, you know the signs. So sure. what, are, what, what are some of the tips you want to give to the electorate to protect themselves during the forthcoming elections? First of all, I want to urge Nigerians to always, always be sensitive when these politicians are speaking irresponsibly of their status. We should not allow ourselves you know, to, to, to be used against ourselves. But in most cases, it is usually Nigerians killing Nigerians. So they must be very conscious of utterances that they listen to from these politicians. And we want to also appeal to the security agencies. They have a lot of role to play in ensuring that the voters are secured, they have confidence in the process, and nobody goes to vote and gets injured or killed. Mm. So our people must be vigilant, but they must be conscious of the antics of the politicians, irrespective of their status. Mm. Irrespective of their status. That's a safe place to land. Thank you so much for joining us. It's today. my pleasure. All right, so I've been speaking with uh, public affairs analyst Femi Lawson on electoral violence in Nigeria, the nature, the causes, and of course the solution. That's our show for today. Please join me again, same time, same station, tomorrow. I'll be right here. 
Until then, take care of you. Bye for now.